Etihad Airways, once a bright young aviation upstart and now very much fallen on hard times. I'm in business class, unfortunately though, gone is the delight of the super jumbo and the multiple flights a day. Now, just a much smaller Boeing 787 shuttles once a day over to Abu Dhabi. Possibly because there's a distinct lack of customers. Melbourne, number two in terms of size of cities in Australia, endured the world's longest lockdown over the pandemic and still passengers seem reluctant to go anywhere. Lots of flights, but it's eerie seeing the terminal so empty. I needn't have worried about finding somewhere to sit while I wait for check-in to open, and there we go. And there's absolutely nobody ahead of me as I head to check-in. It took nearly two whole minutes to get through security and walk through deserted duty-free and head to the lounge after looking at some of the other airlines which are now coming back to Melbourne. The lounges upstairs are away from the hubbub of the terminal. Now it had used to run his own lounge in Melbourne. Not any longer. Those days have long gone and the lounge is just a shadow of itself. Although the changes started when it was taken over by the UK's number one lounge, who in turn offloaded the lounge onto Swissport, who now operate it as a basic paper entry lounge. Don't think it's cheap though, and it comes at a distinctly upmarket price if you have to pay for it, but it provides a comfy seat if you've got the odd $100 or so to spend, or you get it for free if you're in business class. Now the Etihad House Melbourne Lounge is lovely, but forget all the glowing reviews of the past. It's now a much more basic generic airport lounge. Once upon a time when it was run by Etihad, it used to have an a la carte restaurant style dining as well as a well-stocked bar offering some rare and unusual spirits, plus an overall high quality experience with at table full service. It was the go-to lounge in Melbourne and gave the Qantas first lounge a run for its money. Instead now you get a small buffet, tiny salad bar and sandwiches. Hmm. Occupying most of the window spaces annoyingly, um, the bar through which you can see the runways. There are seats at the bar but they're fixed to the floor and you tend to have to ask other passengers to get out of the way while they're leaning over you ordering for drinks if you sit there if, that is, there were any other passengers. Or you can carry your food into what was originally the dining room to enjoy your microwaved lasagna. There's also beer with Peroni in bottles. Now the house lounge is located in one of the best possible locations in Melbourne Airport, high up in the new extension with fantastic views over the runways. The fixtures still show elements of their original quality. There's a lot of marble. On entering the lounge, along with the views, I was struck by how much space there is. It's a genuinely decent, large, airy lounge, with floor-to-ceiling windows and acres of seats. Finally, the sky bruised, dusk went about dusking, uh, and there was still no sign of my 787, or indeed, other passengers. The staff were very apologetic and told me the aircraft would hopefully make it to the airport eventually, and offered yet more cocktails. That eventually, finally happened, two hours late, and Etihad found where they'd parked their aircraft. And after one last cocktail, I was invited to make my way down to the gate to head from Melbourne for the 15-hour hop to Abu Dhabi. And that's what we've been waiting for for quite a while. The Etihad 787 Business Class Cabin with the half a dozen passengers who are going to be joining me. Seats are in a 1 2 1 layout, 22 inches wide, with a seat that slides down to a flatbed 73 inches long. I was welcomed with a glass of champagne, and the amenity kit from Aqua de Palma was at the seat. A menu and the wine list are also there as I boarded, and the cabin was so empty, the crew asked me if I'd like to take some more photos and take a wander around. Well, it does seem to be a lovely cabin. There's mood lighting with an elegant side lamp to illuminate the studio seat with various dimmer settings. At the crew's invitation, I wandered back to have a look at economy class on the Boeing 787. At the front of economy, there's Etihad's new economy space class, an extra five inches of legroom, but definitely not premium economy as we know it. I was shocked at how empty it was, 
not just empty, but seriously deserted. The rest of economy seats are 17 inches wide and have a 31 inch pitch with a seat configuration of 333. This is absolutely standard for an airline flying the 787. The economy class cabin was, well, you can see it, empty. Occasionally seats have windows as well. Um, I really hope Atahad gets some more passengers because this lot won't be paying to keep the lights on, let alone the fuel. There's the usual rather large TV screen, a split fold tray table and USB charging sockets. The novelty of the remote also has a quite large screen which can show different channels to the main screen, such as a moving map. But with loads like this, it's no wonder that Etihad have cut the Melbourne route down to only one flight a day with a much smaller aircraft at that. Back in business, it's much more comfortable, particularly with one crew member to each customer. The champagne flowed, indeed it was hard to stop the crew from pouring yet more glasses. Now I was hoping for a full amenity kit, unlike the shorter option offered on flights to London. Unfortunately, although somewhat bigger, it's still only a basic amenity kit, and no pyjamas are offered. With Etihad's drastic cutbacks, they've been enhanced out of existence. Now, Etihad's new business class seat has fully flat beds for a good night's sleep. The airline specified these before their cutback started, and the hard product remains. It's got very good direct aisle access from every seat. The small remote, which also has a screen on which you can display the map, is quite useful because, goodness, that main screen is very slow. Although it does have live TV when it finally works. The Etihad Airways film selection is called Ebox and comes with a hundred movies, lots of TV series and games. However, I have heard some passengers say that there isn't much to watch. That's simply because you've got to explore through the A to Z list to see what's loaded. Now the small armrest beside your seat doubles as a stowage area, it's lifted up with a small catch and it's got noise reducing headphones in there. They're great, high quality with a decent sound. I went through the long haul version of the Aqua de Palma amenity kit. Now it comes in a dark leather bag and it really looks the part, but unfortunately like its short haul cousin, it doesn't have that much actual content. There is an eye mask, earplugs, basic wool socks and the famous uh, signature fresh fragrance, which is basically a whiff of cologne. Now there's plenty of stowage with room beneath the ottoman at your seat for shoes, plus a small shelf in there. Seats themselves, they alternate with half of the seats facing backwards. That's a little bit unusual, particularly at pushback, and your legs go into a little tunnel in the seat in front. All gaps also have a small gap to the aisle. You've got to push the seat back to uh, actually get out comfortably. It had the latest safety videos and arty shoot at the Louvre Abu Dhabi and it also includes in-flight prayers. Now that's the route we're going to be taking over the Gibson Desert and then over the Wallaby Plateau. Haven't they got a lovely name? And uh, nudging Sri Lanka at the bottom of India before in 14 hours we finally get to Abu Dhabi in time for breakfast. Most of the route, as you can see, is over the ocean. Of course, the 787 has extended range twin operations approval, or ETOPS. Great to see it on the in-flight map. However, the screen itself is an awfully long way and it's virtually impossible to touch it without climbing out of your seat. The remote control solves this issue, but it's a bit awkward and clunky, and often you want to leave it on the in-flight map because, let's face it, Etihad will offer a lot of different ways of maps. Hear those huge General Electric engines roar into life, and I hope those two engines turn or passengers swim. Uh, that's the other meaning of ETOPS.
But anyway, there we go. Two hours late, climbing out of Melbourne in the middle of the night. We're up, aloft and climbing over the wonderful delights of Ballarat. Time to get comfy in the seat, which has almost as many positions as there are lighting controls. There are table lights, mood lights, atmosphere lights, and all with four levels of brightness, and all with yet another touchscreen control. The designers really went to town with the lighting design. Meanwhile, service, it was very swift, very, very swift. The crew didn't so much as trot through the cabin taking orders as do it at a brisk canter. More champagne was handed out and I was asked if I wanted my nuts warmed. Clearly there's one part of the service Etihad hasn't permanently cut back. The menus appeared quite comprehensive, a little bit more of that later. There were so few passengers, the crew said I could have a couple of meals if I wanted, but clearly they were begging me to say no as they wanted to get the service over and done with. Indeed, before we'd even hit the cruise, the Arabic Meze came round. This is a classic Middle Eastern appetizer. Don't miss Etihad's unique cutlery designed for the airline in the Cotswolds before the airline hit hard times. Do wonder now if they count all the cutlery on and off the plane. Clearly, service is also suffering from cutbacks. Just a year or two ago, each dish was brought out to you individually from the galley. Now, everything is on one tray, from starters to mains to dessert, including the bread. It's quicker, but a lot cheaper. I went for the braised short rib with cheese polenta, baby carrots and broccolini. I didn't have much time to enjoy it as the crew tried to take my tray away from me before it even finished taking videos and photographs of it and I had to hurry onto a breaking bread to dip into the olive oil and balsamic vinegar. Now there is a mini bottle of Monte Vibiano mixed oil and vinegar on each tray. I was slightly less impressed to see after the meal service the crew were taking used ones off the tray to reuse on later meal services. Some good wines on board. I went for the Shiraz de Maine Tolato from the Pyrenees in Victoria in Australia. The 2015 vintage is a red, rich and intense vintage with blackberry fruit notes. Dessert was a chocolate delight with freeze-dried raspberries no less. It was very rich and very, very good. I enjoyed it, but again, it was served at the same time on the tray, saving the crew time. But clearly, presentation was not something that Etihad were particularly caring about. Now with dinner done, by the time we were over Adelaide, I took a stroll through the in-flight films. In the blockbuster section, there are only a dozen listed, and you've got to delve into the sub-menus to see everything that's available. Well worthwhile doing so, because hidden away are several art house British films which would otherwise be hard to find. And it must be said there's a huge amount of dross in there as well. You can order drinks from your seat. I tried this and nothing turned up at all. Eventually when I found a crew member, they explained they'd turned off this function as it disturbed them in the middle of the night. And I had to ask in the galley for another glass of the excellent two-track Sauvignon Blanc from Marlborough in New Zealand. Ten hours later, I managed some sleep, if only because there wasn't a lot else to do and the crew seemed to pretty much vanish during the night. We're nearly in Abu Dhabi now and I, like many of the passengers and certainly the crew, were looking forward to finally landing. But not before we have breakfast. Now, Etihad are famous for their in-flight breakfasts and the menus offered everything from, well, cheese omelette with chicken sausage, herbed potatoes, baked beans, ratatouille frittata, passion fruit muesli, toasted banana bread. I made my choice only for the crew to announce nothing had been loaded. The only option if you wanted anything hot for breakfast was the crew meals. And that was egg on toast. 
not bad egg on toast, indeed a very good egg on toast, but not what I was looking forward to. At least there was a decent latte and orange juice and the tray did contain the promised warm breakfast bakery. There was natural yogurt, apple compote, toasted granola and seasonal fresh fruit. But it was all served on one tray, brought straight from the galley. There's no mucking about with individual plated service, so no, it was slammed down. Tray was brought out, tray was taken away. At least there's a nice big table to serve it on, but um, surely it's not too hard to load a meal for half a dozen passengers. Anyway, there we go, heading now into Abu Dhabi. All too soon we began a very slow descent into Abu Dhabi and it was clear why this aircraft had been delayed. Abu Dhabi has had some of the most torrential rain it had seen in decades and all flights were delayed. The city normally gets about half an inch of rain a month in the rainy season and the rainy season only lasts one month, the rest of the year pretty much dry. Instead, an abnormal storm had arrived and brought with it several inches of rain, which the airport and runways were quite simply not designed to handle. Now the delays, and indeed the very long time on the plane, gave me some time to ponder the current state of Etihad. Etihad no longer gives you a lavish treatment when you're on a flight, but it does get you where you want to go in some style, and with most of the perks you expect with minimal fuss. Now certainly the hard product, the seats, the planes, they were ordered before Etihad tightened its belt. It's good to see that the Abu Dhabi based airline is still using the aircraft it ordered despite years of heavy losses and major cutbacks across the board. That strange quirk of arriving in Abu Dhabi in the middle of a virtually unknown Gulf storm caused yet more problems. I did think of it as some curious novelty until I realised that the desert based airport which has sunshine 340 days a year, well for it, even a drop of rain causes chaos in its operations. Getting off the plane in the rain was a hassle. Look at the queue of passengers and that's most of the plane in front of me. Even as soon as I was off the plane, then Abu Dhabi seemed very, very quiet. And suddenly, I saw where all the passengers were, waiting at Abu Dhabi in the rain. Disembarking the plane in Abu Dhabi funneled me straight into the flight transfer hall. Business class gives no fast track here at all, and the very slow queue took over an hour to get through. It was clear that the business class queue was actually closed off simply because there were so few passengers. I was determined to visit even for a few minutes the Etihad business class lounge at Abu Dhabi at Terminal 3. I'm glad that at least that was open. However, Etihad Airlines has had a run of bad luck lately and it's struggled to maintain its once extravagant moniker as reimagining flying, but it's still trying hard. Its survival, even in a slimmed down form, is impressive, and the fact that it does so with a quality seat and aircraft is even more impressive. <laughs> 